Hello and welcome to Nature Live Online from the Natural History Museum. I'm Alison, I'm your host for today. Now hopefully some of you have been following our weekly uh, live broadcasts, but if you're new to Nature Live Online, these are shows where we chat with experts from around the museum and beyond and find out about their fantastic work in fields from dinosaurs to DNA, from volcanoes to vampire squids and much, much more. And I'm particularly excited for today's show because we've got two special guests for you. Now have you ever wondered how prehistoric animals like dinosaurs actually lived day to day? How they fed? How they slept? Mated? Did they ever get sick? Well a new book Locked in Time by Dean Lomax and Bob Nichols showcases 50 astonishing fossils that give us glimpses into the real life behaviours of prehistoric animals. And we're going to be finding out about some of those fantastic fossils today with Dean and Bob. Now, as with all of our shows, we love to hear from you, our viewers. So please don't be shy. If you've got any questions, any comments during the, the course of the show, pop them in the chat. We'll do our very best to answer as many of your questions as we can in the time that we have. And if you're enjoying the show, do consider leaving us a small donation. Every little helps. If you're watching us on YouTube, there's a donate button that's just by the chat. Or you can go to our museum website, nhm.ac.uk forward slash donate. All donations greatly appreciated. But let me introduce you to our two speakers for today. First up, we have Dean Lomax. Now, Dean is an award-winning paleontologist, a TV presenter, and an author. He's traveled the world, researching, naming, discovering prehistoric animals, and he is an expert on ichthyosaurs, which may come up in the course of conversation later. So let's say a very big hello to Dean. Hello, Alison, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's so great to have you. I'm, I'm very, very excited. I can't wait to, to chat about the book. But also joining us today, of course, we have Bob as well. Bob Nichols, our world-renowned natural history artist. Bob's um, artworks, his models, his recreations have appeared in books and exhibitions all around the world. And some of our viewers and museum fans might remember the brilliant artwork that Bob did for our, our stegosaur, Sophie, which was just a few years ago. But let's say hello to Bob as well. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hey. Brilliant to have both of you today. Can't wait to, to get stuck in and chat about the book. But, but first up, massive, massive congratulations. The new book, Locked in Time, it was out last week, right? Yeah, yeah, it was officially published last week on Tuesday. Thanks so much, Alison. <laughs> It's brilliant. I have had a, a sneak peek. I, I've, I've read the book cover to cover now, I think, and I absolutely love it. It is brilliant. It's a book I think I will return to time and again because there's just so many great stories that you've you've compiled, Dean. And not just dinosaurs. It's There's fossils, there's uh, mammals, there's insects, there's fish, all kinds of stories. And each one is brought to life so beautifully by your, your expert artworks, your recreations, Bob. It's a, it's a brilliant book. So much congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. That's an awesome endorsement. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I thought it was it was fabulous, but but Dean, I know this is a book that has uh, it's been a, a long time coming. It's been a long time in the making. Uh, tell us where the idea for the book first came from. Yeah, you could say it's been millions of years in the making. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I had to say, it, I'm really sorry, start with a joke. <laughs> okay, so for that, we uh, we have to go back to to 2008, and so when I was 18 years old, and to a trip to the USA. See. In the UK, I just finished my my G set or my A levels, and my <laughs> grades weren't particularly very good. So that so I couldn't go to university. Obviously, I needed the grades to go to university. I couldn't 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 go. But also, I didn't have the fi the finances either to go to university. So instead, wait for this. I ended up selling my childhood Star Wars collection. <laughs> and to do that, I, I sold this collection to go and fund a trip to go and dig up dinosaurs in the USA. And it was to go with a marvelous museum called the Wyoming Dinosaur Center. And on my very first day, I was given a tour of the museum displays by a, a fellow volunteer called Jordi, who, who was there from Spain. And Jordi showed me through the, through the collections and I was blown away by everything there until we got to one fossil which changed the way in which I, I kind of looked at fossils. See, 
this was a really massive limestone block. Now, if you look at the far right on this, this image, this is where this little animal had landed on its back. It then wriggled around, eventually righted itself, and then it walked for 9.7 meters, where it was then eventually left dead in its tracks. And this is a little animal called a, a horseshoe crab. So horseshoe crabs are still, still live today, but this was a juvenile only 12.7 centimeters long. This fossil is about 150 million years old. It comes from an area called Eichstatt, and it is very, it's a very famous area that also is very close to Sonhofen, where, where fossils like Archaeopteryx have, have come from. This is yeah. such an incredible fossil that it gave me the, the spark, the idea for a book about behavior, because what we're looking at here is the entire moment in, in time of the, of the behavioral interaction of, of this animal, where it's, it's dropped onto the bottom of this, which is a, an anoxic lagoon. So it's, it's very toxic, there's no oxygen, where it's then struggled, it's, it's walked along the, the bottom of this lagoon, struggled against the oxygen, and then it's genuinely suffocated to death. So it's, it's a terrible, tragic scenario, but for a paleontologist, it gives us so much information about behavior. And, and I was genuinely captivated by it. It, it allowed me to see fossils in a completely different way you know see these things as living breathing animals rather than sort of static objects so that's where the the original idea and concept of this this book came from it's an incredible fossil and there's that there's a that there is an entire story just just captured in that that one image and it's just, it's one of, of 50 incredible stories we saw the the uh the the book cover uh just a little earlier that incredible uh dueling dinosaur scene there of all the fantastic stories in the book how did you come to choose this one for the cover yeah, I had a good long chat with Bob about this and we came up with a few different concepts, but we kept coming back to to this one because the, the reconstruction there is of a very, very famous fossil that was discovered in 1971 in Mongolia of a protoceratops, which is a, an earlier relative of a triceratops, literally locked together in combat with a velociraptor. These, these are genuinely fighting dinosaurs that were preserved together for millions and millions of years, 70, 75 million, over 75 million years ago. And a remarkable fossil. And it's, a, it's also very iconic and unique in that it's the only, so far at least, definitely confirmed example of, of two dinosaurs found fighting together forever. And it seems so obvious because this is such a captivating fossil that it tells this unique story of behavior that it had to go on the, the cover. It is. It's such an iconic fossil. And Bob, this image is wonderful. It's one of my favourites. So much drama. Yeah. Well, we, Dean and I did talk about uh, a few different options while we were thinking of the cover. And, we, you know, it wasn't an easy choice to make because we wanted to try and portray some different behaviours as well. Because one of the main messages of this book is that dinosaurs and prehistoric animals, they're not movie monsters. They're real mm. complicated animals with surprising behaviours. So we weren't sure whether this was the right one to put on the cover, but it was such an iconic specimen. And I decided to illustrate it from just a, a moment before the actual positions preserved in the fossil. So we've got a little, something a little different here as well. And I, you know, I, I consider it my job to try and bring details to a picture as well. So yeah, I think this is the world's first uh, dinosaur book cover with a pooping dinosaur on the cover. And I didn't just add that in there just you know, for comic effect or anything like that. And um, that's a real behavior that, that occurs in nature when when animals have fights, you know, the, the, the blood goes up, the, the adrenaline flows and they, and they they have bodily reactions. And one that is quite common is that they will they will poop whilst they're fighting. So there's a little, little bit extra in there. So, um, yeah. And then, of course, I wanted to tell the whole story of what locked in time is. It's behavior that's fossilized in the sediment and then exposed by paleontologists, which is why. You know, at the end of the tale, we've got the fossil there and the uh, some classic tools of the paleontologist. Yeah, yeah which was really a, a nice touch as well, Bob. And you came up with that idea. I and mean, when you sent it across, I was like, oh, that is very, very neat. I really like that. So, yeah, I, I think it's it really happens, I do. Yeah. <laughs> 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 absolutely absolutely and it, it's the perfect choice it's a perfect choice for the cover um, but there are so many incredible stories in the book so many uh, different aspects of, of animal behavior represented in the book and we're just gonna have time to delve into a few of them today um, but I wanted to start with not with dueling dinosaurs but with another fighting pair a pair of mammoths what's the story here 
this is it's a remarkable find and i can throw that word around so often but it genuinely is such a remarkable discovery this one so this specimen as is is not so well known about paleontologists would you would you believe it's it's not been formally described in the scientific literature but it's been known about since 1962 so this is of two big bull Colombian mammoths that were found in Nebraska, where they are literally together, locked together by their, their tusks. And if you imagine, look at look at this, uh, this painting by Bob here, you compare this to modern day African elephants that often during, during particular parts of the sort of mating season, they'll come together, they'll fight for dominance, and you you have this, this happens due to a, a state known as must, which is where they're basically, they're, um, their testo testosterone in their body goes into overdrive. It's kind of similar to, to sort of like the deer rutting season where they'll clash heads together, they'll clash their tusks together. This is what we think was happening with the, the Colombian mammoths because they, they genuinely become locked together through their tusks. And now the reason that that managed to happen is because one of the mammoths has a complete right tusk but a broken left, whereas the other one has a complete left tusk but a broken right. So they've managed to get in so close together, clash heads, and then they become stuck. And I should point out that the geology and where they've been found was, was kind of like a stuck, sticky, muddy area. So you imagine these have been backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards pushing until one of them is probably stood victorious, but it's become still attached to the other. So perhaps one of them even died and, and the other one just couldn't pull away. And, and then they've been preserved for, <laughs> for, for over 12,000 12, years. It's a spectacular discovery. And my, my personal favorite story to that I, I really, really enjoyed writing in Locked in Time. Uh, yeah, one thing you, you uh, talk about in the book is it's just the incredible unlikeliness of, of this entire series of events, not just the fact of them being locked together, dying, being yeah. fossilized together, and then being found. It's yeah. it's incredible. Exactly, and it was found by chance. And then some, something else with this, which I'm gonna let Bob elaborate a little bit on as well, is that with, with this is not only do you have this, obviously this fighting, but there's a, some sort of finer details that Bob added for, for not even just for dramatic effect. <laughs> Are you going to make me talk about the penis, Dean? I am talking oh. about the giant mammoth penis. Right, okay. So I'll talk about poop, now it's penis. Okay. Well, yeah, I, I wanted to tell them a bit more of a story as well. So you've got details like the, the tusk is going into the eye socket, which is actually preserved in the fossil. Um, again, when animals fight, they have bodily functions. So we've got the inflating penis here. Um, but I also wanted to add a sense of size and, and weight to the, to, the, to the mammoths, you know, they're two huge, perhaps 10 ton animals fighting. So there's 20 tons of meat fighting. So I tried to give a sense of scale in here. Um, I used the coyote, which I think Dean can talk about a little more in a moment, but by lowering the the, 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 the light behind, I can use some um, light shining through the fur to add drama. Um, also by creating the silhouettes also makes them look larger. A um, bit of dust around as well. And also you can see that they're breathing heavily. You can see that mm. the, missed from their breath you know this real exertion this battle that could have been going on for hours so yeah it's all that sort of detail i tried to put in there to bring it to life yeah and you talked there about the little coyote as well so that's not again just added to to emphasize this the actual size of these individuals that is based on this discovery so there was a little coyote was found under one of the the, the legs of, of one of the mammoths mm -hmm. where its skull is crushed so potentially, was this a, a lone cow? Was it part of a pack or something that were watching this dramatic fight kind of ensue on, on you know, right there and then? And did it get in too close, get crushed? Or did it go to to feed on on, on the dead one and then the, the, the live one collapsed on top of it? <laughs> now, is it something like that? But, but yeah, that's directly based on the on the fossil as well. Absolutely, and Bob, your recreations, they are they are scientifically accurate, all of them, aren't they? They're, they're, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and I've got um, information from a few other sources as well. I mean, there are cave paintings that show that when mammoths got excited and they ran, they could lift their tails right up in the air, which is something modern animal, uh, elephants can't do. So by using cave paintings, I was able to add little details like that in there as well. These excited mammoths have got their tails right up in the air. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that's fighting. That's that's kind of fairly clear cut, obvious what's going on there. But for some fossil behaviours, takes a little bit more work to mm. interpret, doesn't it? And we've got our next example is 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 just such an example. Some puzzling scratch marks found in the ground. Yeah, what could the, these represent? 
Yeah, these these are a, a real oddities. So they are found at four different locations in Colorado in the in the USA. And you can see me there on the on the right examining one of these in, in 2017. Now they were only described in in 2016, so a year earlier than that, as uh, as giant sort of scratch and scrape marks made by effectively a dancing dinosaur, which really does conjure up such an incredible image of a, of a dinosaur dancing. But you know, if you, you compare with uh, with modern birds, which of course are, are living dinosaurs, and some of the the birds that say uh, that that essentially dance to impress the opposite sex and the weird and wonderful kind of courtship displays, that's what we're looking at here. Now, I might think a moment, hang on a minute, that's a bit of a stretch, but it's not when we compare it to modern ground nesting birds that do something very similar. So in order to, to impress the opposite sex, they, they come together in large groups. And, and this is what are called, called lex. So this is a particular behavior called lecking where they scratch the surface with their with their feet to effectively show to the to the female that they are really good they're strong they're, they're good at, at building nests and that then it, hopefully if the female goes with them they would go uh, goes with that individual they would then go away and build the nest and that's what we have here because at one of the sites there was more than 60 of these large scrape marks that were all brought together and we know that they were made by a by a large big theropod Theropod dinosaur, which Bob Bob has brought to life in this this beautiful reconstruction. Thank you. Yeah, one of the challenges with this was trying to get different elements in. So we needed to have a close up of the fossil lek. We needed to have uh, you know some kind of idea of how what type of dinosaur it was creating them and how large they were. Because although we don't know precisely what dinosaur made these these fossil these trace fossils. We know they were quite large. You can look at the, you know, the size of the scrape marks and know they were quite large, perhaps around six, seven meters long. So I wanted to show they were big dinosaurs. I wanted to show the fossil, but I also wanted to show the dancing as well. So the challenge is when you have all these different elements, the challenge is to bring them together in a kind of plausible, natural looking way. It's very, when you're trying to put so many different things into a composition, it's easy to make it look contrived or a bit cluttered or too busy. So. Um, yeah, so by lowering the angle, I was able to get a good view of the, the fossil. Um, being underneath the, the dinosaur in the foreground gave us a sense of scale, and you can see it scraping away at the, and creating the fossil. And then you've also got the dancing behavior behind, and they're kind of posh, the, the two males are posturing, trying to show who's got the biggest mouth, the strongest head, that sort of thing. And then in the background, we've got the, the lone female looking fairly disinterested. Hopefully their performance will actually get her excited in the near future. <laughs> Yeah, she looks. She looks deeply unimpressed. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of thinking of the of birds today, like birds of paradise, and, and their incredible dancing displays. And then that in dinosaur form, that would be incredible to see, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, like an animal that's sort of five, six, seven yeah. meters or something. You know, you'd be like, yeah. oh, that's mad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and the sounds they made as well. I imagine it would have been impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but there, there is a, an entire chapter in the book, isn't there, that, that is is devoted to to sex, yeah, and entirely, yeah, behavior. Entirely, yeah, entirely <laughs> devoted to sex. It is a really interesting chapter to to write about. <laughs> it's a very interesting chapter to read as well. <laughs> we had a, a, a question actually come in from uh, Dylan on YouTube that's that's relevant here, asking how you tell the the the, the sex of, of dinosaur fossils. Is that easy to do? With great difficulty, Dylan, <laughs> enormous difficulty. There's there's not a really any, any reliable way uh, to tell the sex, bar if you have some extraordinary preservation of the of the soft parts, which in some cases Bob could elaborate on a, in a moment. But um, in other cases, you have to when you're just looking at the bones, it's really really hard. So so if you can can work out, for example, you have two dinosaurs of the same species. And perhaps one has a slight, perhaps one has a, a crest, or the other one doesn't. Or if it has a slightly larger crest, or if it has slightly 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 larger tusks, or something like that, that can kind of hint that it might be a, a female or, or or a male. And then the other options might be if you had things like feathers preserved. So there is one fossil in the book that I'll, I'll not go into too much detail, but there we have evidence of the males and females that have reliably been identified as male and female through looking at the the differences in feathers of those this particular dinosaur this particular bird from from china but also through histological studies so by cutting these bones up you can examine kind of bony the, the, the structure kind of under the microscope and some of the bones will in certain dinosaurs will indicate that this individual was pregnant so therefore you know it was a female 
versus the others, others which don't show the, the evidence of, of pregnancy. But there's another bit which Bob can elaborate on with his two friends behind him there in, the, uh, in, in his picture. <laughs> uh, what do you mean? Do you mean as in display, different coloration, sexual dimorphism, that sort of thing? Yeah, with, with, with sexual dimorphism and uh, the, the, the idea of uh, the, the preservation of the, the recent Sitakosaurus specimen as well. Yeah, well, we recently published a paper on the cloaca, so we've actually got um, information from a fossil, from the fossil that I used to reconstruct this dinosaur, Cetagosaurus, that suggests that they had quite showy cloacas, and a cloaca is the one orifice does everything that reptiles mm -hmm. and birds have, and it suggests that they had kind of um, glands that could create smells that would have... Um, Kind of attracted males or and or females, so it also it suggests that maybe there's all sorts of complicated or complex or impressive behaviours attached to display that we can legitimately speculate about now, which is exciting. Yeah, that is incredible. Mm. Yeah, so very effectively, impressive. Dylan, it's incredibly hard. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very good question, Dylan. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Dean. Uh, in the book, we've got, we've got uh, evidence, we've got direct evidence, haven't we, of of pregnancy and even birth in in some fossils. Um, ichthyosaurs, particularly, we can't yeah, get away with, with, with not <laughs> we're talking no, about yeah. ichthyosaurs. <laughs> yeah, we need to mention ichthyosaurs. These are an incredible group of, of marine reptiles. They're not dinosaurs, not swimming dinosaurs. They lived at the same time as, as dinosaurs were, were sort of living on, on land, but these animals live exclusively in the water. And I've spent now, more than a decade of my academic research dedicated to studying thousands upon thousands of ichthyosaurs, including practically every single specimen at the Natural History Museum. It's a bit of a, a, bit of a stretch to say that, but it, it is thousands of specimens there. And this one in particular is really important because right at the back where the, you see where the, the ribs end, you have a tiny, and the, and the tail starts, you have a tiny, probably less than 10 centimeter long little baby ichthyosaur there. There's a tiny skull. And this individual, we know, of course, this individual is pregnant and that it's a, that it's a female. And this was important because it was found by a, a prolific fossil collector in the UK called Joseph Channing Pierce. He found it in Somerset in a quarry in 1846. Now, there's been more than 100 ichthyosaurs have been found with, uh, with embryos inside. And for quite some time, it was a kind of a debate whether they were showing cannibalistic behaviors, like these ichthyosaurs ate baby ichthyosaurs, which I like to call icklets, or <laughs> Whether, or whether it was that they were pregnant. And it wasn't until we found specimens like this extraordinary fossil that comes from a, an area called, a town called Holzmarden in, in Germany that is roughly 180 million years old. Now, what you're looking at here is an ichthyosaur called, ichthyosaur called Stenopterygius. And to the right, you've got a little baby that was coming out. She was, she was actually giving birth to this little baby. But unfortunately, the, the head got stuck. And so... As, as it would happen, it was a very tragic scenario that not only did this little baby die, but its, um, its siblings, which were in between the, the, the ribs there, all together, five individuals died. So she was pregnant with quad quadruplets at the time. And you see this little baby is coming out tail first, like modern cetaceans, when they give birth, they give birth to wh you know, whales and, and dolphins give birth to little calves. It's the same sort of thing. So although it's a very tragic fossil, it tells us a lot about these animals because these are reptiles. Ordinarily, when we think of reptile birth, we might think of crocodiles and turtles and a lot most snakes that that give birth. You know, they lay, lay eggs, whereas ichthyosaurs they didn't. They lived exclusively in the water, and they also had to had to breathe air. And and this is you know the beautiful reconstruction again that that Bob has, has brought to life of that that tragic scenario. It is a it's a beautiful recreation, and that those fossils are incredible, and and we we have them at the museum, and it, it just it makes me wonder. They're they're we've got on display, and people walk past it every single day. It makes me wonder how many people don't even notice and, yeah. and don't realise the significance of of what that fossil actually shows. Yeah, it, yeah, it's wonderful. No, exactly. And you have that original specimen from Somerset there. The, the actual real specimen is on display and you have a, an exact perfect replica of the of the one giving giving birth to you. So next time you're at the museum, go and yep. check it out. Our <laughs> doors are open. Go and check it out. <laughs> um, we've got quite a few questions coming in from our viewers. So I just pause uh, briefly to, to take a couple of those. Um, Professor Flint uh, watching uh, from Australia. Um, his book is arriving in the post imminently. Oh, excellent. Very excited. Good, um, asking, are there any examples from Australia in the book? 
There are, but I don't want to say which ones. I want to leave it as a surprise for you, Professor Flint. <laughs> You're probably thinking, <laughs> <"Come on." laughs> I, I can assure you that there are some examples discussed there uh, from, from Australia, which I think you'll, you'll really like. Oh, you tease. Excellent. <laughs> he, is, he is, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> um, and a, a great question actually coming from uh, YouTube, uh, referring to the, the dinosaur um, uh, dinosaur spe specimens that's, that from the cover, asking what type of event would allow those dinosaurs to be preserved fighting? What kind of dramatic event would have killed them in that pose? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so to set the scene with this, it, it is very similar to how, we, how it was found in the Gobi Desert in Mongolia, and it's actually it was a similar environment. And there's been quite a lot published on this since 1971 when it was when it was originally discovered. And the best interpretation, and which most paleontologists agree upon, is that whilst they were fighting, they're in a they're in an environment which is sand dunes. Presumably, there must have been like a thunderstorm that triggered, you know, heavy rain that triggered the the sand to, to literally flow over them and trap them for for all eternity. And that's definitely that that is the best interpretation because the lifelike nature of the pose, how they're preserved, there's there's no other way. They didn't fall into kind of water or something like that. It's just an instant reaction of to this. You imagine this giant sand dune collapsing, just flowing straight over them. Hmm. Incredibly dramatic. <laughs> um, and a lovely question from Isabel, aged nine, um, was asking, how do you know where to dig for fossils? Ooh, very good question, Isabel. You, so you can find fossils all around the all around the world. And paleontologists, back back in the day, when we before we knew where to really look for fossils, we used to just go out and look in pretty much randomly go and look at look at various rocks anywhere to see if we could find fossils. But what we actually do today, we can build on, on research that is published. So we can go and read books, we can read scientific research from other paleontologists, and we look for sedimentary rocks, things like limestone and shale. And so we then have an idea that we, we probably would find fossils. So if we, for example, if we went fossil hunting here in the UK, we went to the, to the Yorkshire coast. If we find fossils of, of squid-like animals, like this one I've got behind me, like this, so these are an ammonites. If we found evidence of that, then we'd know that we were looking at a marine environment so that we'd expect to find marine animals. Whereas if we found, say, a dinosaur footprint, then we would know that we're looking at an environment that's that's on land. But you can find fossils practically anywhere anywhere in the world. You just gotta know where to look. Look at look for the look, read the books. And and I'd also recommend if you do want to go out fossil collecting, it's always important to go out with uh, jo join a fossilized uh, fossil hunting group because it, they show you how to do it responsibly and, and to show you what to look for as well. A fossil group is very different to a fossilized group, isn't it, dear? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Can very good advice thing? from Dean and Bob there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, now, let's move on because there are a couple more um, fossils from the book that I'm really keen to talk about. Um, first up, trace fossils. We've touched on this a little bit with the with the dinosaur dinosaurs dancing. Um, they are quite common, aren't they? Probably more mm. common than than um, than fossil bodies. Things like footprints, yeah, claw yeah. marks, that type of thing. Some animals, though, they leave behind bigger traces than others, don't they? Yeah, so they do. <laughs> what are we looking at here? <laughs> it's just like some enormous tunnel, isn't it? That you can you can drive a car right right through here. You know, I'd walk through being six foot five. I'd walk through here without even having to duck. This is an enormous tunnel, and these these were first discovered. These are all found in, in South America, pr pri primarily in Brazil and, and Argentina, and they were first found in the nineteen twenties and thirties by uh, by locals and, and by visiting geologists. And people kind of head scratch and thinking, well, we have no clue what these things are. And it wasn't until there was the remains of giant ground slopes found in the same area. And so paleontologists and the geologists put them like, like this one. So this one's on display at the Natural History Museum of a, of a mega, mega ground sloth, aptly named Megatherium, that, uh, that were literally the size, these are sloths, the size of, of elephants. They're, they're massive. So these things didn't live in trees. And they, they also, I should say, they weren't like modern day sloths. They weren't very slow either because in modern day sloths, they are, that slowness is a, a form of protection. So it's it's so that animals, eagle-eyed animals can't can't spy them. Whereas of course, <laughs> something the size of an elephant, you, uh, you, you're not gonna be moving slow. Otherwise you're, you're, you're in for a bad time from some saber-toothed cats. So the, the, the great size was important for them, 
But the most important thing is that they dug underground burrows and like the tunnels that you showed there. And they, we found hundreds of these things, which can go on for, for you know, one of them, I think, goes on for over 100 meters. So these are really massive burrows. And we know that they were made by these giant ground slugs because all along the walls of many of these burrows are, are enormous sort of claw marks made by the ground sloths that match exactly the shape and structure of the claws made by ground sloths. And then the final thing that kind of nails it for you here is that in some very rare examples, ground sloths have actually been found inside the tunnels as well. So it kind of brings it, brings it all to life and brings it together. It's so hard to imagine that that giant sloth as, as a burrowing creature. We're used to tiny, tiny burrowing creatures. It's it's incredible. Yeah. Uh, let's take a look at your uh, your recreation book because I absolutely love this one. Talk us talk us through the, this recreation. Yeah, this was one of my favourites. Um, I, I do love this the, the fossils as well. By the way, when I tell my friends about it, they're like, "What giant ground sloth? You don't have to make it up, Bob. It's interesting enough already. You don't make oh yeah." And they build tunnels big enough to drive a car through. Yeah, they just, they're like totally ridiculous. But yeah, like, so this is one of my favourite subjects to illustrate. So I wanted to get a variety of behaviours in there. So we've got one digging in the background. Uh, two adults appearing in the foreground. One of them is, is scratching its back on the edge of the opening of the of the, um, the burrow. But uh, I wanted it to be quite chaotic on the outside of the burrows because as well as scraping away all the all the, all the soil, and um, that must be hundreds of tons of, of soil that they have to shift out of these enormous burrows. So I imagine the the scene outside to be quite chaotic with lots of piles of soil and stones and bits, you know, just chaos everywhere so that was the idea so um and also in the foreground we've got two juveniles and i i thought well if you're going to be digging these enormous burrows as you're growing you're going to need to be able to build up those muscles so i imagined that for these juveniles it would be kind of instinctive to to want to dig and to to practice digging to build up their muscles so in the foreground we have one that's just instinctively digging and it's building up its muscles and learning the the, the, the skills it needs to learn and uh, the one behind us just kind of nonchalantly just sitting there on a pile of soil getting covered in soil but you know they're burrowing animals it doesn't care it's kind of like yeah whatever <laughs> it's another day um so yeah i wanted to get a variety of different things happening in this picture um and uh, another small detail art is above you've got a hint of, of an avocado tree which is important which is related to ground sloths right dean it is. That's a really good point to to make, Bob. So so modern avocados that you know we have on our toast, we have on you know as guacamole. We can thank the giant ground sloths and other giant extinct megafauna for the avocado because they were the biggest animals at the time that could generally swallow the the avocado whole and including the seed and then go far and wide and poop these <laughs> avocado seeds out and effectively plant trees. Now, of course, uh, the giant ground sloths and the other megafauna that could do this are all long gone but the the avocado still kind of lives on it's the in i guess the in some sort of form of ghosts of uh, ghosts of the uh, ghosts of the ground sloths <laughs> <laughs> so every so, time we eat avocados we should tip our hat to the ground sloth we should i always do this definitely <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Um, we've had actually a question from Cassius on the subject of trace fossils asking what's the largest trace fossil found that's a oh, tricky one that is a tricky one cheers for that Cassius yeah <laughs> <laughs> I would I would actually say I, I do think there's something in the back of my mind that it's it is telling me that at least these giant ground sloth burrows the ones that are over a hundred meters I'm sure I've read somewhere that they are the the biggest the the certainly the biggest in size but also I think the mm. longest I could be wrong because, of course, if you think about dinosaur tracks, there are some trackways that are incredibly long as well. But maybe as a as a single trace, uh, single continuous trace, perhaps it would be these burrows. But yeah, the, you know, dinosaur trackways. If you include that as a, you know, there, there are some dinosaur tracks that go on for 200, 300 meters mm. and more. Um, and another really interesting question. Um, someone was asking if there is a lot of evidence for the type of skin, fur, feathers, etc., shown in 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 the illustrations. It will vary greatly depending on the subject. Yeah, um, like with ground sloths, we even have specimens of their skin with the fur attached. Um, with some dinosaurs, we've got skin impressions or feather impressions, whereas others we have nothing but their bones. So it. it varies enormously depending on the type of animal and how old it is because of course the further you go back in time the 
the less you know of, often you lose resolution in the fossils so yeah it would really depend on what animal you're talking about really um it's such a broad variety of of different quality of fossils yeah it's from anything from archaeopteryx where you've got the, the bones and a suggestion of the the the, the outline of the, the feathers to the like the detail of the feathers to something where you might only have a tooth so it varies enormously mm. and for the sloths for example we do have yeah. samples of, of, of fur is that correct and, mm -hmm. and droppings and things like that so quite a lot of yeah. detail for some some animals but not so much for others yeah it varies enormously you'd have to you know spe specify which particular animal you're interested in and then i could tell you really. yeah yeah, and you actually have some of that in the Naturalist Museum collections, don't you, as well? Some mm, fur yeah. and droppings from, from giant ground sloths, which is just it's just mind-blowing to even think that you have that. In fact, there's a really cool story with that, I should just really quickly say, is that when they when the, the first geologists and, 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 and local people to the area came across these the, the ground sloth droppings, they actually thought they were of a of an animal that lived was still alive in the area. So they were like, oh, where is this? <laughs> you know, searching one of these caves and finding finding this, because it was that fresh. It, there was apparently still smell to it. Are we talking poop again? We need to move we are, on. I know, I know. <laughs> always, always with the poop. <laughs> <laughs> but there is there is one more story I definitely want to get to. Uh, we've talked um, homemaking. We've talked uh, fighting. We've talked sex even. We haven't spoken about feeding yet because the, the fossil record can tell us an incredible amount. It can tell us more than, than even who eats who, can't it, Dean? And there's yeah. one story in the book. It's got my favourite chapter title, I think, ever. Hell pig meat cash. What's that all about? <laughs> so, I'm glad you like that title. I, uh, I was pretty proud of that. It sounds like a rock band, doesn't it? it Heavy does, metal band. Yeah. Hell yeah. pig meat cash. <laughs> yeah. So this, what you're looking at here, is a, a jumble of bones belonging to a small sheep-sized camel called Pebrotherium. So it sort of looked a bit like a, a miniature version of, a, of today's llamas. And this was discovered in, in Wyoming in 1998. And upon discovery, immediately something seemed a bit odd about it. Now, what we've got in here, we have one complete skeleton, six partial skeletons, and then lots of fragmentary bones. And effectively, all of these individuals have bite marks on them, like literally everywhere across the skull, across the, the necks, and, and down, down the back along the, along the spine. What we're looking at is the leftovers of an animal that was preying on these little camels. Now, what it did, this animal, I should say, so it go, this is what goes to the title, these were, were hell pigs, or what we call entelodonts, and this, yeah, they look like really nasty, gnarly looking animals. And this one is a species called, uh, a genus called Archaeotherium. Now, Archaeotherium, although they're called, nicknamed hell pigs, they're actually not related to pigs at all. They're more closely related to whales and, and animals like that. And so they, they kind of call hell pigs for their kind of pig-like appearance. And six of the camels in that block have literally been sheared in half. And the bite marks on these camels, they match perfectly with the tooth shape in the, the jaws there of Archaeotherium. And even to the point where the bite marks match perfectly. So you imagine the jaw, every single piece of, of every single tooth in that jaw matches perfectly on the, on the camels. So what you're looking at is where this animal, where this Archaeotherium has genuinely stashed its leftovers, kind of like what we do, right? Putting food in a fridge and it wanted to, to, and this is a behavior I should say is known as, as food caching or, or hoarding, which is similar to what squirrels do, you know, in the winter kind of getting together nuts and things. And uh, effectively Archaeotherium stashed this for later, but it didn't ever eat them. <laughs> it never got the chance to eat the remains of these camels. So they were preserved, probably quickly buried by mud or something along those lines. And the uh, the artwork for this is absolutely incredible. Yeah. If we can take a look. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Thank you for those nightmares, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, well, I wanted to illustrate how wide, one of the unusual things about these animals is they could open their mouths really, really wide, like beyond 90 degrees, I think. So uh, I wanted to show this huge gape and I thought, that it, I think from the fossil, we understand that they, they preferred eating the back end of the animal. Maybe it's like all the muscle around the rump, you know, it likes all that meat there. So I wanted to show this big creature swallowing a hole, the back end of a whole <laughs> tiny camel. So, yeah, that was the drama I was going for. And so in the foreground, we got the pieces of other camels and, you know, flies. I wanted, you know, this 
pile of meat is going to attract lots of flies and other insects as well. So I put those in there. So we've got lots of buzzing creatures flying around. Yeah. Yeah, and it, make, and it makes for such a dramatic reconstruction as well. And I think it really captures that story really well. And again, which is one of the things I want to capture with Locked in Time, is that it isn't just these kind of standard behaviors. When you think of feeding in prehistoric animals, hoarding behavior, you know, caching of, mm. of food, like leftovers, it's not something that immediately comes to mind. Plus, mm. Archaeotherium is a pretty badass animal as well, one of these healthy. So eating, imagine this, this kind of pig-like creature eating small camels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I also another detail I remember is that they don't look like they should be hoofed animals, but they are hoofed. So I, I also just yeah. you could just see like the forefoot that it's got hooves as well. So yeah, a little detail that I wanted to make sure yeah. was visible. Incredible, absolutely incredible. Uh, we are almost out of time. I'm, I'm disappointed to say because there's, there's so much to talk about. We've had quite a few questions from our viewers as well. So I just want to uh, get in some of those questions before we wrap up. Um, a question for you particularly, Dean, uh, came in from Noah, age seven. He's one of our regular viewers. Um, he, he was asking uh, whether ichthyosaurs are mammals. They're not, are they? No, hey, hey no, no. So, so ichthyosaurs, they are, oh, in fact, you know what? Let me just grab one of these. <laughs> well, this is what I had earlier. <laughs> so ichthyosaurs, they kind of look a little bit like, uh, this is scientifically accurate as well, I promise you. So this is, uh, they look a little bit like, like dolphins or sharks, and they first appeared around about 250 million, million years ago. And so this is about 20 million years before even the first dinosaurs were, were on land. But they are, are not mammals, they are reptiles, and they're very distantly related to likes of, of lizards. But I mean, that's very distantly related. And uh, yeah. They're the coolest prehistoric animals as well to have ever existed. I promise you. <laughs> well, that was quite a short answer, Bob, considering yeah. it was on Ixthyosaurus. Yeah, I don't, I don't yeah. want to get carried away. Don't, don't, don't. I mean, I'll, I'll continue if you want. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was good. That was a good answer. <laughs> um, and a question from Natalie on YouTube. She uh, was asking, "How did you pick the fifty fossils, and will there be a follow-up book?" Oh, a great question, that Natalie. <laughs> I. I spent years and years going through the scientific literature and going through books just searching for the literally the best fossils that can provide an unprecedented glimpse at the behaviors of prehistoric animals. And so then bringing this together in five sort of fascinating chapters, we mentioned like the sex chapter, there's fighting, biting, feeding, there's a, there's a chapter on unusual happenings as well. You know, so some, some sort of random behaviors that we've kind of put together at the, at the end of the book in, in this, this one chapter. And originally, I should say that the book was originally going to be 100 fossils. It wasn't going to be 50. But then it immediately <laughs> became clear to me and Bob that that was, uh, that was too many. <laughs> so, we, you know, because there's, there's so much cool stuff to talk about. So fingers crossed that we... We hope that if the book does really well, it may it may do a you know may lead to a, a volume two, and then we can include some other really epic fossils as well, and we can do this all over again. Brilliant, <laughs> brilliant. I mean, uh, there's only forty five more fossils to talk about in this book, let alone the next book. So exactly, yeah, we definitely exactly. want you back. <laughs> Um, and, and Cassius on Facebook earlier was asking um, you both what your favourite fossil in the book is, um, and Bob, I wondered what your favourite re recreation was as well. Um. My favourite fossil is probably the, the burrows, the meg megatherium. Um, it's just so odd. Uh, favourite illustration would probably be um, the in the wake of the Colossus, where we have the giant Memenki saws walking through the mud. That's the one. Yeah, and one of the most difficult things to get into a picture is to portray size, to make an animal look big. And what I was quite pleased about with this one is that the Memenki saws, the sauropods, the long necked dinosaurs in the background, they really feel kind of big and heavy. I feel like they're lumbering through the background, you know, but you can see that the, the moving, something so big, movement is quite, you know, uh, hard work. So you can see the breath, um, which also suggests that they've got a like um, high metabolism. There's warmth in, inside their big, huge bodies. Um, yeah, I know you, the, 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 the mud in the foreground looks wet, which is difficult to achieve. I did that by having the low sun reflecting off the ground. So there's lots of little details in there that were that actually, I felt, worked quite well. So, yeah, this is probably the one I'm most happy with. Brilliant. We are sadly completely out of time. There is never enough time. There's too much to talk about. But thank you both so much. It's been absolutely brilliant. And we would definitely love to have you back on. Um, and again, congratulations. The book is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Alison. It's been a been a real pleasure, and uh, I enjoyed chatting as well. Uh, you know, with the two of you, but also answering the questions. So thank you for for sending in your questions. 
Brilliant. Well, hopefully we'll see you again very, very soon. Uh, but we'll say good, uh, goodbye to you for now. Thank you. Bye. And thank you to you, our viewers, for tuning in, joining us today for your fantastic questions. I apologise if we didn't get to your question. There were so many coming through. But they were absolutely brilliant. So, so thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. Do join us again next week. We have a show every week. Next Tuesday, our show is at 1 p.m. And my colleague Alastair is going to be chatting pterosaurs with uh, one of our uh, conservators, Kieran Miles. So tune in for that one. You can also uh, find out about what's upcoming on our social media channels and our website. And you can catch up on previous shows, including this one, on our YouTube channel. I'll say goodbye for now, but I hope to see you again next time.